In this first lecture in the Liv Hume Lectures in Chinese Philosophy at Aberdeen University, I will speak on engaging Chinese philosophy. I'll start with this beautiful painting that is here on the screen, and it is a painting of Fu Si, who is one of uh, the Chinese cultural heroes. This is a 16th century painting held in the uh, National Palace Museum in Taiwan and the painting is by Turing. Now, in the painting you'll see um, Fu Si doing something with his hands, um, almost as if he's holding a circular shape, and you'll see also at his feet a little circle of uh, very uh, vaguely painted figures. I'll come back to that. The Chinese philosophical traditions, including Confucianism, Daoism, Moism, and Legalism, originated in the period between the 5th to the 3rd centuries BCE. This was a difficult time in China, and historians have aptly named the years from 475 to 221 BCE, the Warring States. Territories were fought for and defended across a large area, covering approximately a third of uh, today's China. Here is a map of roughly around the period between 250 and 201 BCE, and it's a map uh, by Xu Yu Wei of Rochester University. You can see the colored in portions are the warring states, and then the bigger dotted um, line, the more comprehensive dotted line of uh, contemporary uh, China. Confucius, Lao Tzu, Mo Tzu, and Zhuang Tzu were key figures active during this period, although we're less sure about the existence of Lao Tzu. I suspect that the name is more a, na a name that has arisen uh, as an honorific, as an old master, associated with a text bearing the same name, uh, rather than that of a definable identity. These figures were identified as founders of China's philosophical traditions and we will examine their ideas in this lecture series. To give a broader sense of this period, these thinkers were contemporaries of Pythagoras, Heraclitus, Parmenides, Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, Epicurus, Siddhartha Gautama, more widely known as Buddha, uh, and Zoroaster or Zarathustra from uh, Persia. In contemporary philosophical research, comparative cross-tradition work in ancient philosophy is quite robust, especially between the early Greek and early Chinese traditions. The Chinese-Greek comparisons tend to focus on fascinating questions about moral life and human agency, social order and political authority, and importantly, conceptions of a good life. In the early Chinese context, Political advisors, some of whom were authors of texts associated with uh, the various traditions, offered solutions to the warring states' unrest. They debated matters relating to a number of issues, including the welfare of the people, the regulation of economic production, control of the state, the ruler's part and authority and his relationship with his advisors, military strategy, and the moral rectitude of both the ruler and the people. Many philosophical texts were written and compiled during this period. The Zhuangzi, a Taoist text, also from this time, refers to the different views as the hundred groups of families of learning. Not all welcomed the debates. The Mozi, another text we will look at during the course of these lectures, was concerned about the confusion arising from having so many visions on offer. In one way or another, the texts from the Warring States period touch on what it means to live well, giving particular consideration to the role of the state in setting up infrastructure to support human flourishing. These backgrounding features of early Chinese philosophy have shaped its key questions and the way thinkers during this period present arguments for their views. In this first lecture, I will highlight some characteristics of the philosophy of Warring States China. I begin with a focus on change, a fundamental theme in Chinese philosophy and on its implications for the early Chinese thinkers. In many ways, it is not surprising that thinkers during these unsettled times were deeply aware of their ever-changing circumstances and what change meant for them. To discuss the idea of change, 
I introduce an iconic text in the Chinese tradition, the Yi Jing, or known as also as the Book of Changes in translation. The text has been influential in Chinese intellectual history and its influence continues to the present. We could use the cliché, change is the only constant, aptly to express a fundamental theme in Chinese philosophy. The Yi Jing embraces the idea of change in its schematic account of the processes and interactive patterns that underlie all things. Change occurs at a range of levels, including in relation to all forms of existence, seen and unseen, such as ghosts and spirit beings. And also change happens with natural phenomena, such as weather and climactic events. At the cosmic level, change happens in relation to the operations of heaven and earth. This is a metaphysical picture of sorts, though its focus is not so much on substances as on the dynamic interactions between things. The phrase, 10,000 things, the one Wu, denotes all that exists. It highlights Chinese philosophy's attention to plurality in the world and to the patterns of interaction and influence between things. The Yi Jing's account of processes and causation begins with eight trigrams. And here are the eight trigrams. At this point, I'll take you back to uh, the beautiful painting we saw uh, by Chu Ying. Here again is Fu Si, uh, the sage. And you can see, uh, perhaps blown up now, a little bit clearer, a circle of little images uh, at his feet. And here I've blown it up not too perfectly. Uh, you, I've darkened the eight images. These are the trigrams. And Fu Si is said to have been the originator of the trigrams. Uh, here again are the trigrams. Now the trigrams consist of, as you can see, broken and unbroken lines. The broken lines represent yin, and yin has the characteristics of non-assertiveness. Um, it's associated also with femininity, uh, softness, and pliancy. By contrast, the whole lines, the yang, uh, are associated uh, with a set of characteristics uh, including hardness and uh, masculinity. Together, yin and yang signify the interaction of complementary polarities which are constantly in flux. And here in the trigrams is the manifestation of the different combinations of yin and yang. And they express the ongoing dynamic of decline and renewal from which nothing is exempt. Here is a list of uh, the names and the translations of the different uh, trigrams. When we look at the names, we should not think of these tri uh, the names or these trigrams as representing substances. For instance, when you see body of water or thunder uh, or mountain. Really, we should think about the processes or the characteristics of the objects um, or the phenomena associated with these objects. Dynamism is what is being conveyed here rather than substances. In addition, the trigrams should never be taken as standalone symbols. Their interactivity is what we should focus on. The pairs work together, such as, for instance, heaven and earth establish positions, and thunder and wind give rise to each other. The different combinations of the eight trigrams are said to present a complete set of the principles of transformation and change. And here is a picture that captures the dynamism of uh, the eight trigrams, that there are the names of the eight trigrams around the circle. This is a diagram of the supreme ultimate, the Tai Chi Tu, um, again from around the 16th uh, uh, century. The phenomenon of change is captured by more than trigrams. The trigrams are stacked, in fact, to form hexagrams, six line figures, with a total of 
64 possible permutations and combinations. And the result of these 64 hexagrams and manifestations of change is a complicated picture of how uh, change affects everything. So here are the first 32 trigram uh, hexagrams and here is the next 32. You will see that they refer to a whole range of things. Um, they refer to dispositions, uh, emotions, conditions, objects, uh, and this is a complex unwieldiness. Um, and it seems the early China, uh, Chinese thinkers were confronted by this unwieldiness. Several chapters of the Yi Jing, which were later editions, reflect on the nature of change, and these are philosophically fascinating. The Yi Jing is a composite text, and it has a few layers added over time. The trigram and hexagram sections incorporate ideas from early in the first millennium BCE. But ten appendices were added later during the Warring States period. The appendices, also known as the Ten Wings, contain reflections on why it's important to understand change, not least its practical implications. As an entire text, including these later editions, the eating may be understood as an attempt to understand how changes come about and how they affect life. I think of some of the sections of the eating as a mapping exercise, including uh, the hexagrams, uh, which I see as an attempt to scope the roles of humankind in this world. The eating's compilers also sought to understand both the limits of human action and the heights of human achievement. The later editions, the sections that are philosophically interesting, also express deep awareness about why it's important to understand change. In one of the appendices, for instance, um, known as Zhou Yi, there is a passage that says, and this passage quotes Confucius, well, rather than quoting Confucius, really it, it um, uh, asserts that Confucius says this and leans on Confucius's authority. The master said, to get into danger is a, master, is a matter of thinking one's position secure, to become ruined is a matter of thinking one's continuance protected, to fall into disorder is a matter of thinking one's order enduring. So this is a problem. Complacency. Therefore, the noble man when secure does not forget danger, when enjoying continuance does not forget ruin, when maintaining order does not forget disorder. This is the way his person is kept secure and his state remains protected. The changes say this might be lost, this might be lost. So tied to a healthy, flourishing mob. We're warned about complacency, especially not to take for granted that our circumstances will continue unchanged and to prepare for change by establishing stability in certain aspects of life that is, by tying something to a healthy, flourishing mulberry. Contemporary scholarship continues to debate how we may interpret the eating's reflection on change. What I have attempted to demonstrate in this brief overview of the eating and its views on change is the Chinese tradition's tension to the flux and dynamism in the world. In my mind, it also reveals a way of thinking about the world that does not home in on the attributes of particular things. Rather, it emphasizes the patterns of interaction between things. And I believe the 64 hexagrams reflect a sense of the messiness of life as the early thinkers would have experienced it. Some of you who are familiar with ancient Greek philosophy might want to compare or contrast uh, these ideas with, for example, those of Heraclitus or Parmenides. In what follows, I highlight two prominent features of Chinese philosophy that arise from this awareness of change. The first is the need to orient oneself in order to find one's feet. This task involves establishing certainties in life, the things that don't change or which don't change as much, allowing a person to get their bearings. This is the flourishing, healthy mulberry tree referred to in the eating passage. The second and closely related feature of Chinese philosophy is its focus on self-cultivation. This process involves the cultivation of capacities so as to navigate life better. First then, on orientation. Being aware of imminent change and not knowing what it will bring is very likely to cause anxiety. In the passage in the Ten Wings section of the eating, it says explicitly that those who composed the changes were anxious. 
It is unsettling when we perceive that our environments are constantly changing as they would have been during the Warring States period. And I'll cover how um, the early thinkers sought to orientate themselves across these three traditions. Before we go there, however, let me illustrate how unsettling change can be with an illustration from our own experiences. We've just come through, we hope, the COVID pandemic, although its impact is still with us and doubtless will persist into the future. It's not difficult to recall how hard it was for governments and health officials to respond to the spread of the COVID virus, when few, if any, understood its boundaries and patterns. It was new and it brought change, many negative changes for humanity. What was the mulberry tree that we could tie our certainties on in the case of the pandemic? Different scenarios played out in different countries, sometimes requiring a daily response as new strains emerge. It was really difficult to get our bearings. To orientation, the question of getting bearings across the three traditions. The need to orientate and sometimes to reorientate ourselves is a palpable concern in early Chinese texts across its different traditions. The early thinkers sought to understand those aspects of life that are within human control and those uh, beyond our remit. They worried about eclipses, weather events, revolutions in the socio-political domain, material well-being and health and illness, among other things. They described what was beyond human control using the language of fate and fortune and misfortune. In addition, the cosmic landscape of heaven and earth set the stage, as it were, on which the interactions between the 10,000 things, the one we referred to earlier, would play out. Humanity was accorded a potentially important role in the unfolding of events, but this was only possible if humans were able to establish a tripartite cooperative relationship with heaven and earth. Or so the Confucians believed, but other thinkers took a different tack. So in what follows, I discuss how the different traditions offer different approaches to orientation, and I begin with how the early Confucians conceived of humanity's orientation in the world. As I see it, there were two important anchors in an ever-changing world for the early Confucians. First, at the personal level, our relationships. Relationships with people we can count on who will stick with us through thick and thin are a fundamental feature of Confucian life. Confucian philosophy provides nuanced detail on a range of loyalties and obligations and where relevant affection in different relationships. In order to cultivate rewarding relationships, ideally the family context provides a nurturing environment within which a child first learns to relate to others. The second anchor in Confucian philosophy are the established norms and practices that create a familiar socio-political context for the people. Aspects of Confucian moral life, such as benevolence and propriety, serve as the moral glue of society as they guide people's interactions. These shared norms provide the framework within which people make sense of their projects and pursuits. The passage I show next captures the shared forms of life that facilitate human interactions. And here again, leaning on the authority of the master, a passage from the Analects, the text most closely associated with Confucius. The master said, a person who does not understand destiny has no way of becoming an exemplary person. A person who does not know to exercise, to practice ritual propriety, has no way of knowing where to stand. A person who does not understand words has no way of knowing others. These are different forms of orientation. Understanding the shared norms and engaging with them provide an important locus for human interactions. They help people to orientate themselves within society and in relation to others. Both the moral environment and the fruitful relationships I mentioned earlier are two foundational sources of stability in Confucian philosophy. Indeed, so important are relationships in grounding us that Confucius was meant to have said, the person who at age 40 still evokes the dislike of others is a hopeless case. Moving on to the lowest tradition. The Moists, whose founder Morton lived in the 5th century BCE, advocated the use of standards as the anchor for human endeavours. The Moists were men engaged in the manual crafts 
And from their experiences with measurement tools such as the compass and the plumb line, they propose the application of a standard for morality. Mozart said, those in the world who perform tasks cannot do without models and standards. Even officers serving as generals or ministers, they all have models. Even the hundred artisans performing their tasks, they too all have models. The hundred artisans make squares with the set square, circles with the compass, straight lines with the string, vertical lines with the plumb line, and flat surfaces with the level. The skilled are able to conform to them exactly, the unskilled, though unable to conform to them exactly, by following them in performing their tasks, still surpass what they can do by themselves. Their idea was simple. There is a standard of measurement for human goals. Some of us are better at using it, some worse, but use of the standard helps us all do better. The standard for the most was benefit for all, an early Chinese version of consequentialism. It sought to distribute benefits to all. As the Moists saw it, this doctrine of benefit for everyone could be applied straightforwardly to all human undertakings. If a particular initiative was being considered, the basic question to ask was, does this benefit all concerned? Unlike the Confucian commitment to the moral leadership of exemplary people, something I'll discuss in my second lecture, the Moists located stability in a shared standard a common standard that could be applied by anyone. If society were to orient itself according to the standard, all would stand to benefit. We'll look at Moism in the third lecture. Another group of thinkers, the Taoists, were more contrarian in their understanding of how humans could situate themselves in the world. Contrarian, that is, in not seeking to implement elements of stability in life. The Taoists did not seek the Maori tree of certainty to tie significant aspects of life to. In fact, they believed that attempts to fix our ways of life are misguided. After all, from the Taoist perspective, if circumstances have changed, it is unhelpful to persist with ingrained responses. From where they sat, persisting with ingrained responses is not only unhelpful, at its worst, it is a hindrance at it, as it prevents people from engaging responsibly with emergent circumstances. The passage here critiques the rigidity we bind ourselves to. The potter says, I'm good at managing clay. I round it until it matches the compass square, until it matches the T-square. The carpenter says, I'm good at managing wood. I curve it until it matches the arc, straighten it until it corresponds to the line. Do you suppose the inborn nature of the clay or the wood which is wishes to match a compass, T-square, arc or line, and yet somehow or other generation after generation bursts into songs of praise. The potter and carpenter are so good at managing clay and wood, and this is the same error made by those who govern, who order the world. The Taoists understood the orientative processes differently from their contemporaries. From their point of view, setting down anchors introduces a level of rigidity that could obstruct a person's more spontaneous engagement with the world. We'll encounter more of the views of the Taoist thinker Zhuangzi in the final two lectures. I will say briefly at this point that because of their emphasis on orientation, it's sometimes said that early Chinese philosophers did not seek truth in the way philosophers in the Western tradition have. I do not think this is entirely true as the early, thinker, early Chinese writers did seek to make distinctions such as that between right and wrong, for example. More significantly, however, I believe the early Chinese thinkers did work with uh, epistemological concepts, perhaps not truth, but the concept of accuracy. They sought to ar articulate an uh, accurate understanding of how a person orientates themselves. So what kinds of capacities do we need to orient ourselves effectively? These capacities do not come easy. Therefore, early Chinese thinkers also turned their minds to the question of self-cultivation. From what we have seen so far about orienting the self, it is clear that a range of capacities is needed, whether it be, say, to understand the potential consequences of our actions, or the sensitivities of, other, of others, or the resources required to implement a plan of action or one's own abilities to bring a task to completion. Before I move to look at the Confucian and Taoist uh, 
um, approaches to cell cultivation, I want to talk about four general capacities that are referred to in the early Chinese texts and are, which are generally shared across the traditions. In order to orientate ourselves, one of the things we need to do is to understand the patterns of change. We need to have observational capacities that accurately map out what is going on. We need intellectual acumen to grasp how things affect and are affected by others, but that is not all. To understand the chains of causes and effects or correlations, we need to exercise observational skills to discern what has changed, how it has changed, what the possible causes are, and so on. Back to Fu Si again, the sage attributed with the creation of the eating's trigrams. In the eating, he is said to have had these capacities. When in ancient times, Lord Baozi, that is also how Fu Si is known, uh, Lord Baozi ruled the world as sovereign, he looked upward and observed the images in heaven and looked onward and observed the models that the earth provided. He observed the patterns of birds and beasts and what things were suitable for the land. Nearby adopting them from his own person and afar adopting them from other things, he thereupon made the eight trigrams. We're not told exactly how, but the passage speaks to Fusi's capacity to learn from his observations and apply them. It would not be possible to present an exhaustive list of what is involved as the process of mapping patterns across domains would be domain specific and would therefore need to be undertaken on a case by case basis. If this sounds too complex, think about the ways in which we use analogies and metaphors and more recently memes that map across domains. The level of creativity involved in mapping across domains often means that greater systematicity is not possible. I move on next to the second uh, aspect of self-cultivation. One needs to accurately grasp one's own capacities and dispositions. If a response is required from us as a result of change, we need to think about whether we're capable uh, to deal with the situation. And here, in discussing this aspect of cultivation, I draw on the Confucian analects uh, to show one case in which a person um, um, is aware of, is, is very self-aware of his capacities and another case in which he's not. And Confucius interacts with them and points out um, their strong points or uh, their defici deficiencies as the case may be. In the first case, the master gave Chi Diao Kai permission to take office. Chi Diao Kai replied, I cannot yet be trusted with such a responsibility. The master was pleased. Please, we take it because uh, Chi Diao Kai demonstrated a good, a good amount of self-knowledge. By contrast, Zi Gong said, what I do not wish others to do unto me, I also wish not to do unto others. And Confucius commented, ah, Zi Gong, that is something quite beyond you. These two examples from the Analects demonstrate the text's tension to accurate self-knowledge and Confucius does not hold back to point out Zi Gong's deficiencies. The third aspect of self-cultivation, a realistic assessment of possible responses. We need to understand the resources that are needed to respond to change. We need to perhaps examine precedents and models and we need to be able to reason about them and with them. We need to understand risks and trade-offs. And we need to have a good um, sense of realism in assessing all of these. In the Zhuangzi, there's an exchange between Yan Hui, Confucius's favorite disciple, and Confucius himself. So these Confucian figures sometimes figure in the Zhuangzi text, a, a believed to be a Taoist text. Yan Hui believes he's courageously taking on a noble mission, working with the Prince of Wei, a terrible tyrant, with the aim of turning the Prince of Wei around to virtue. So Yan Hui comes to Confucius to say, look, this is the mission that I'm thinking I, I, I will take on, um, probably hoping for some praise from Confucius. Um, but instead, 
um, let's see what uh, Yen Hui says first. Um, Confucius disapproves of his mission, and that will come later. Yen Hui says, I have heard that the ruler of Wei, having reached the prime of his life, has become quite tyrannical in his ways, making frivolous use of his state without seeing his error. He thinks nothing of the death of his people. Nationfuls of corpses fill the marshes, clumped in piles like bunches of plantains. The people there are utterly without recourse. And what does Yen Hui propose to do? So this is a proposal that is unrealistic. Uh, in response to this tyrannical ruler of Wei Yan Hui says, I wish to take on what I've learned from you, Confucius, and to derive some standards and principles from it to apply to this situation. Perhaps then the state can be saved. Confucius said, ah, you will most likely go and get yourself executed. What a downer, um, Confucius's response is. But let's see why Confucius says this. Confucius has in this story, the role of a spokesperson for the Zhuangzi. He notes that um, in the course of the conversation with Yan Hui, that sages in the past have made sure that they're completely secure in their commitments before they take that out to others. He's not sure that Yan Hui has that. But he also grants that even if you have that, Yan Hui, um, you will take that to the courts of the Prince of Wei and you will um, try to convince others. Now, Confucius says with quite a lot of humor in this passage in the Zhuangzi, you're con that if Yan Hui constantly harps on these values, that would make him deeply unpopular, particularly with the prince. So either way, if Yan Hui is firmly grounded in his values, uh, um, he might become a deeply unpopular figure. Or if Yen Hui is not deeply grounded in his values, uh, he's sure to fail anyway. And therefore, uh, in brief, according to Confucius, Yen Hui has misconceived his vision insofar as the, uh, uh, encapsulated in his proposed solution. They do in the conversation work towards um, Confucius then works Yen Hui towards what is a viable solution. I now come to the fourth aspect of self-cultivation, seeing what is salient. The capacity to see what is salient is closely intertwined with our beliefs and commitments. To see what is salient is grounded in our motivations and our views about what matters. For both the Confucians and the Taoists, the capacity to understand what is salient is central to moral life. Confucians seek to cultivate sensibilities for the Confucian moral virtues so that people are able to distinguish between right and wrong, and moreover, to act aptly in making these judgments. On one occasion, Confucius is quite disappointed with his young followers, noting that they are careless in the details and they do not know to exercise discretion in responding to the situation. Here is the passage. Confucius said, My young friends at home are rash and ambitious, while perhaps careless in the details. With the lofty elegance of the literatus, they put on a full display of culture, but they don't know how to cut and tailor it. The passage highlights the moral emptiness of these young followers, that their sensibilities have not been cultivated as Confucius might have hoped. The use of tailoring is fascinating in this passage because it has, it, it has the same connotations as tailor, uh, tailoring has, the word tailoring has in the English language. It is custom made. It is not off the shelf. And um, clearly the disciples there, they um, fail to see what is salient and they take uh, a very formulaic response. They put on a lofty elegance of what they have learned. I now move to talk about self-cultivation in the two traditions, Confucianism first and then Taoism. The aims and processes of self-cultivation play out quite differently for the Confucians and the Taoists. Confucian philosophy seeks to situate people within the communal moral landscape. Shared norms and practices help provide familiarity and ease, allowing people to make sense of their actions and interactions with others. 
So for instance, if all fathers were to appropriately fulfill the duties of their roles, their children would grasp how fatherly virtues are embodied and in turn respond in filial ways to complement their father's fatherly ways. And through time, these values get passed on and entrenched within the community. We'll look more closely at how this works in the second lecture. By contrast, Taoist philosophy is critical of actions that are taken unreflectively and which arise from ingrained habits. In Confucianism, the familiar, that is people with whom we have sound relationships and the norms we share that are manifest in our interactions, help structure human endeavors and stabilize society. That's the Confucian um, uh, items that are tied to the mulberry tree. However, in Taoism, these anchors are impediments. The Taoists are concerned that to nurture a particular set of sensibilities creates propensities only to respond in those ways. Taoism offers models of cultivation that involve the development of capacities to act responsively to the circumstances. In order to do so, one needs to actively forget conventional and ingrained behaviours. These ideas which push back against conventional norms offer a different voice among the warring states' traditions. The Zhuangzi fascinates me in part also because it focuses on manual activities. It reminds us that our existence is embodied, which is an important point, as especially in Confucian philosophy, matters of moral rectitude are often given precedence over other aspects of life. To bring this discussion of self-cultivation to a close, I would like to use a story from the Zhuangzi to help articulate what the Zhuangzi sees as the difference between Taoist and Confucian self-cultivation. This is a story of Confucius walking along, in, uh, in, again Confucius figures in the Zhuangzi in this story, and he sees a swimmer who's swimming in treacherous waters. Um, the story gives us the image that Confucius is very much out of his comfort zone, whereas the swimmer is very much at home. Confucius was seeing the sites at Luliang, where there were cascades of 30 fathoms with sprays of 40 li. A li is roughly equivalent to a third of a mile. No fish, turtles or other water creatures could swim in it. He saw a man swimming in it and he believed that the man was in some kind of trouble and intended to end his life. So this is Confucius's take on the man in the water, simply because this is something deeply unfamiliar to Confucius. Confucius hastened his followers along by the cascades to pull the man out. But after the man had swum a couple of hundred paces, he came out of the water and began strolling along the base of the embankment, his hair streaming down singing a song. Confucius ran after him and said, I thought you were a ghost, but now up close I see you're a man. May I ask if you have a Tao of treading water? Confucius is portrayed in this story as a tragic comic figure who fears for the life of the swimmer. Oblivious to Confucius's apprehensions, the swimmer climbs out of the water with his hair down, singing and strolling. Confucius sees the cascades and waters as dangerous and threatening. He interprets the swimmer's actions as intended suicide. But Confucius is out of his comfort zone. The outdoors is not his environment. Let's see what the swimmer has to say. The swimmer says, I have no personal doubt. I began with what was given, developed what was natural to me, and reached completion in keeping with destiny. I go under with the swirls and emerge with the eddies, following the Tao of the waters without developing one of my own. That's how I can tread water. It is fascinating that in a Taoist text, a Taoist figure claims he has no doubt. This is intriguing, as we would typically expect a text belonging to the Taoist tradition to promote Tao. Let me make some brief remarks about the idea of Tao. Tao may be translated as a way, path, or teaching. In that light, we could say that Confucian teaching is Confucian Tao, Buddhist teaching is Buddhist Tao. In this way, Tao may refer to the practices of a particular tradition, or its approaches, or its sagely insights. Within Taoist philosophy, the idea Tao refers especially to the sagely insight that sets it apart from the other traditions. I'll say much more about Tao at the fourth lecture. Let's return to the swimmers having no Tao. 
Given what I've just said about the Tao, we can assume it would have been a deliberate move of the authors of the, uh, this passage of the Zhuangzi to have the swimmer assert that he has no Tao. The swimmer has no Tao, we believe, because he knows he cannot contest the water's Tao. Were he to assert a particular preconceived way of approaching these dangerous waters, attempting to overcome its currents, he could easily have drowned. The swimmer's knowledge of the water's Tao has been cultivated in and through his contact with the water. And this contrasts with Confucius having a Tao, a Confucian Tao. Confucius's Tao is a way that does not comprehend the Tao of the waters. And as such, he would not know how to respond to the waters appropriately. I now come to the final section of the talk, encountering the text, given all I've said about orientation and self-cultivation as two key features of the Warring States Chinese philosophical tradition. How do we read the texts? In my view, we should not read the ancient Chinese texts as if they were telling us how to behave as instruction manuals. If we read them in this way, we'll very quickly conclude that Confucius, who lived 2,500 years ago, has little to say to us. The way to read the Analects and other early Chinese texts is not simply or primarily to apply their moral practices to our lives. Rather, we should focus on how these early thinkers worked through problems, as for instance, when it describes a person's feeling at sea in a particular situation, not seeing what is salient. It's not so much that these texts provide theories to help us solve our problems. Rather, understanding the issues they raise broadens our imagination about the kinds of things that could weigh us down as humans, trying to do our best in our imperfect lives. Taken in this spirit, the early Chinese texts can open up possibilities for us. The Analects, which I will introduce in the second lecture, is more about struggles to do one's best than it is a text with a clear moral vision. I would like to close my reflections on encountering the texts and this evening's lecture by giving the final say to Zhuangzi, my favorite Chinese philosopher. Zhuangzi advises that we should not follow in the sages' footsteps. What does this mean? These are metaphorical references to the idea of tracks or footprints to refer to the insights that are left by the sages. What is the purpose of these tracks that are left by the sages? That is, the books that we're reading. And how do we use them? Are we to walk in them following the footprints of the sages? The statement makes a distinction between the footprints and the walk of an enlightened person. The statement asks us to rethink what it is we should focus on when we seek to learn. The footprints, that is the actual path that has been taken, or the walking of it. The distinction may be illuminated with reference again to the term Tao, which could mean either the following of the path or the walking of a path. And it is this latter sense of the term, the activity of walking, the gait, that Zhuangzi refers to that we should focus on. The Zhuangzi advocates that we should not walk according to the footprints themselves, but we should attempt to understand how they were made, the gait, as it were, of the walker. It is the walking that is important. In this sense, then, Tao is not merely a teaching to be transmitted from one person to another, from one generation to the next. We will only be able to fully grasp Tao if we look at the activity of walking. This metaphor is instructive. It speaks out against attempt by those who, attempts by those who prescribe and others who follow in the paths of sages. And I suggest we read the texts in this spirit, engaging actively with them to understand how the sages walk, and then to walk our own. And so, taking this approach, I will attempt over the next four lectures to demonstrate how prominent early Chinese philosophers Thank you.